I think th things that I find helpful um, when thinking about the breath as a meditative subject. And here I'm using the term subject uh, as opposed to object, really to kind of point to that quality in the Satipatthana Sutta of contemplating the body in the body. So when we're, we take a subject of meditation, that is something that we're very close to, the subject is the thing closest to us, it's ourself. Uh, whereas an object can be something that can be quite distant or far away that we're removed from. So it's a kind of linguistic trick, but I find it, it helps remind me uh, of how I want to relate to the, to, the, to the focus, the focal point, um, the subject of practice. And in a lot of ways, the, the breath is such a great subject, and I think it, it, it's a, such a popular one throughout time, in part because of, of its qualities. Uh, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's always uh, happening. Um, so we don't have to manufacture the subject. It's, it's something that we can tune into at any time. And so it's the ultimate in mobile meditation, the breath. You can bring it anywhere with you. You have to. And so long as we're living, we're breathing. And then the other beautiful characteristic of the breath is that it's, it has this natural built-in biofeedback. As soon as we begin to relax, settle, and find that sweet spot, our experience of the breath becomes more subtle and refined because the body doesn't need to breathe so much, as much. Our respiration slows. The, the volume of air coming in, the speed of it slows, and we can just start to kind of tune into a more subtle experience. That invites us, in a way requires us to, to develop more vividness of attention. And then the more vivid that subtle breath becomes, the more we relax. And this, there's sort of a feedback loop cycle of becoming quite at ease. Many meditators describe losing the breath entirely at phases of practice. And that can, be, can feel like a hindrance or an obstacle, but actually it's an invitation for, for more vividness, more subtlety. And of course, when we're on the other side of that, when we become anxious or tight or overwhelmed, our breath reflects that state very clearly. We begin to have a more ragged breath, a tight breath. We might feel tightness in some parts of our body and not feel like we can actually feel the breath, say, in our lower belly. And, and all of those uh, sensations, when we tune into them, they can give us a clue as to where we are and invite us in a very visceral way to relax. And so the breath is, is kind of, um, it's, it's unique in that respect, uh, that built-in biofeedback. Uh, and perhaps because of that as well, um, the feedback loop can, uh, it can go in a direction that we don't maybe want to go into, which is we can begin to have sort of anxiety uh, beginning to, to loop uh, in a kind of feedback loop that can grow, uh, so-called po positive feedback loop. And um, it's, I think, just important to, to note that for some people, uh, this is something that comes up quite often with breathing. And so it's really nice to offer other alternatives, other ways of focusing, stabilizing attention. Um, if you're in a position, as I know many of you are, teaching uh, and it's just good to, for us to notice that too i i knew about this theoretically um, but it took many years to actually realize that that was the way i was relating to the breath as well that it actually brought up quite a bit of anxiety and as a result i i for, for many years i didn't even work with the breath uh, I, and i had to learn how to actually have a more relaxed and spacious relationship to it before i could uh, engage with it and i also really needed to learn how to be in my body um, uh, to do kind of the basic somatic and embodied work uh, 
that um, invariably leads one into working with tensions in the body and to working with trauma in the body. Um, so it's not, necess it's not necessarily easy to do that, um, but my experience as you let go of these sort of habitually held tensions and begin to recover some of your own energy, which was previously spent holding these things, you know, holding the lower belly in tight, clenching, holding, you know, uh, ho holding in these various ways that we, we tend to hold uh, when we don't have an unrestricted experience, uh, when we can't just let experience be. Um, And, and kind of along those lines, the other thing I wanted to just, just to highlight, um, and, and this is something I see very commonly, is that many people will tend to work with the breath at the nostrils. Uh, whole meditative systems are built around noticing the breath at the nostrils, um, like the mind illuminated, which has become a very popular um, meditative system. A lot of people I talk to are working with that. Uh, or in the insight meditation tradition, that's how I initially learned was noticing the breath at the nostrils. Um, the The problem or the challenge with the breath at the nostrils uh, is that it encourages, in my experience, a kind of neck up disembodiment. Um, and that isn't to say it's not skillful, perhaps in the beginning of someone's practice to be able to focus somewhere where they feel like they can, because you know, we're familiar with being in our heads and out of our bodies. And so that's actually where it's often accessible. So I'm not saying I, I would discourage people from doing this. It's just to notice the difference between noticing the breath in this tightly constrained area that's up here versus noticing the breath as something which is happening in the lower abdomen or which is distributed throughout the body. That this invites a very different relationship to, to breathing and to experience. And I think a lot of the reason we naturally do that is, well, one, because of our conditioning um, and our cultural moment, um, but also because there, there is <laughs> trauma stored in the body. And why would we want to go into that uh, unless we feel like we have the resources and the tools and the support to actually to go there? Um, so there's kind of a double-edged sword here. It's like, it's great to encourage a more deep and embodied breath, but also when you do that, you've got to work with the stuff that comes up. And we're going to talk more about that as we go, um, embodied mindfulness. Um, but th these three things I wanted to just mention, you know, the, 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 the unique characteristics of the breath, uh, the way that it can bring up trauma uh, and anxiety for some and lead to kind of to spiral. And, and also how if, if we develop a way of working with the breath that continues to keep us disembodied, while it can help develop concentration, it is not very robust in my experience. Um, and so there's a more integrated and embodied potential with the breath to really experience the breath fully in the body.